All right, kia ora. So here is your second task for um, week number six of remote learning. Task one was a CPR quiz. Um, so this is your first content lesson now. Um, in this case, we are looking at some of the identification processes. Uh, in particular, we're looking at the alcohols. Uh, and then we're also going to look at some new functional groups because we think about we need to think about what happens when these alcohols get oxidized. Um, so with our success criteria, we're going to be learning some new functional groups today. It's going to be the aldehydes and ketones. Uh, we're also going to be learning all the oxidation reactions um, and also a little bit on the identification process of organic molecules. So something to kind of consider when we're dealing with organic chemistry is that um, the organic chemicals all have the same visual look. They're all colorless liquids, so it's really hard for us to distinguish um, what we are dealing with uh, just by looking at it. Um, and in fact, most of the chemicals you will come across are going to be colorless solutions um, or colorless liquids, and we need to obviously have a better way of trying to figure out what's what. Um, and that's where these identification tests come in. Uh, these identification tests that we are talking about are all about trying to figure out what function groups present. Um, and you will have a, uh, a question uh, on identification tests on the exam. So it's important that we start talking about this. Now, what I would have you guys do if we were at school is I would give you guys an experiment to test the different alcohols. Um, unfortunately, we're not. So I'm going to kind of recap it and show you what happens with primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols uh, with some videos as well. Um, I'll just switch to the document camera real quick um, as a little reminder of primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols, just so uh, you know what we're talking about. Um, so that primary alcohol is when the, um, the alcohol is directly attached to um, a carbon, and that carbon has um, only one other carbon attached to it, and so the other two would be uh, hydrogens. Sorry, that's a little bit squeezed in there. Uh, a secondary alcohol has the um, two carbons attached to it. I'm just going to write R1 and R2 just to represent a carbon chain, and then there's one uh, hydrogen attached to it. And then tertiary, in that case, uh, you have your alcohol, and it's attached to uh, three carbons. And like I said, the, oopsie, the R is representing some random carbon chain. I haven't specified which one. All right, so there's three different tests that we're going to be talking about. The first two you guys have seen in Redox last year. The last one will be new. Uh, so the first one is the dichromate reaction, um, which is Cr2O72 minus, if you guys uh, remember that from Redox. Um, that one there, I do have a video. Um, I'm going to skip through it because I don't want to watch the whole thing, but I have put the whole thing on my... Um, Google site if you do want to watch it. Um, I think it was somewhere around here that I wanted to start it. Yep. And we'll turn off the sound so I can just talk to you through it. So what we're looking at in this image here is that we've added alcohols to each one of those test tubes and we've added um, dichromate to each one. So this here is my primary alcohol, this is my secondary alcohol, and this is my tertiary alcohol. With the dichromate, we notice that it starts as an orangey color. Um, and what we're looking for for a positive result is an oxidation of that alcohol. So you would see it going from a orange color to a green color. And this is tying back to the redox that you guys did last year. We can already start to see some of that oxidation processes occurring um, because we can see that this one's starting to turn green. So a positive result is the um, color change from green to orange, or sorry, from orange to green. And that's because the dichromate is being reduced to the chromium ion, which is green. And like I said, we did that in our redox assessment. Uh, I'll just pause it here, and what you can now see is that color change. So we see the primary one is changing to that greeny color, the secondary one is changing to the greeny color, and then the tertiary one is not changing. Um, so we're going to write that down in the notes. That was just the main thing from that video that I wanted to show you. So this will go from orange to green. This one will go from orange to green. Uh, and this one won't change, it'll stay green. Sorry, stay orange. 
um, Colt, what else did I want to say? This primary alcohol was obviously the fastest one. Uh, you would have noticed that when it was changing. All right, the second video I wanted to show you was just on the uh, permanganate and the alcohols. This one, I only have the ethanol being um, oxidized and permanganate you saw again with redox. Um, in this case, what you're looking for, let me just turn that on to silent, is um, you're looking for that purple. So the purple is the permanganate, and when it gets reduced, it becomes the, um, I gotta remember, manatees ion, which is colorless. So if there is a primary or secondary alcohol, it'll go from purple to colorless, which we'll see in the video. So she has one on the left, that's the control, so I think it just has water in it. And then this one um, has the, the um, ethanol in it. Um, you also have to remember that you need to acidify it. If you don't acidify it, it will turn brown instead of colorless. Um, let's just skip ahead. It's not a very long video. I think this one I've also linked on to the Google site as well. We put it in hot water to help uh, speed up that chemical reaction. And when she pulls it out, you'll notice the alcohol one is colorless. So that's again, and how I can identify it. Cool, let's go back to the document camera. So permanganate is that MnO4 minus. Um, it's going from the purple to colorless. Unless it's not acidified, uh, then it will turn brown. Um, and that's because you're getting the magnetized ion. So I'll just make some extra notes in case you're curious from, that's going to see R3 plus and that's going to Mn2 plus. Uh, don't worry, we will do a lesson on um, redox. Did my thing freeze? Come on, document camera. That's still recording. Just close that and start it back up again. Sometimes things stop working. Awesome, now you guys can see what I'm seeing again. All right, cool. The only thing that I was adding was just what it was reacting to. You don't need to write that for the organic chemistry um, um, topic because it's not a redox assessment, obviously. Uh, I'm just trying to revise some stuff from last year. Anyway. This one will also turn purple to colorless. This one will stay purple. And that's because in both of the tertiary examples, it doesn't react. Um, and that's why the color change isn't happening. So when we go back to look at the notes, there's some things to kind of keep in mind. So first off, uh, I can use these two tests to identify any tertiary alcohols. And the reason why is because they don't react. The reason why they don't react has to do with the fact that a tertiary alcohol doesn't have a free hydrogen. And in order for these oxidation reactions to occur, we need to be able to remove an alcohol and a hydrogen. Um, so that's why that's the barrier. Um, however, we can't use these identification tests to distinguish uh, primary and secondary. Um, and that's because both of them will react. Um, they both cause that color change. Um, you do have a sense of which one's which because uh, the primary will be faster than the secondary, um, but there's actually a better way to tell the difference between the two of those. Um, some things to also note is that primaries get oxidized to aldehydes and then carboxylic acids, whereas secondaries only get um, oxidized to ketones. This is going to be stuff that I'll talk about in later in this lesson. So um, let's talk about the third type of identification, uh, and that's going to be Lucas reagent. Um, so Lucas reagent is a way for us to distinguish primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols, and it will actually allow us to distinguish all three of them, uh, whereas the other two tests will only allow us to uh, confidently remove the tertiary uh, from the list. So what happens in this reaction is uh, we have a solution of zinc chloride. It is saturated, and we also add in concentrated uh, hydrochloric acid. And these are all 
um, reagents that we need in order to create a substitution reaction. So what's going to happen in this reaction is the alcohol is going to get swapped out for a chlorine. Now, when this happens, uh, we know that a, a reaction has occurred because uh, first off, it's going to turn cloudy, and secondly, it's going to form two layers. And the reason why it's now forming two layers is because the new haloalkane that's formed is nonpolar, whereas this solution here with uh, the zinc um, chloride and hydrochloric acid is a polar solution. So with that polar solution, the alcohols could dissolve very easily because we know that, um, um, I shouldn't say polar, it's mixed into water um, and water is polar. Uh, this alcohol would be soluble in it because we know that alcohols are polar because of that OH. In this case, the haloalkane is, um, even though it has a little bit of polarity from the the halogen, it's not a huge amount of polarity. Um, obviously, we have quite a bit of carbons here, so it's going to not mix. So the aqueous layer will have the zinc, the zinc chloride, and the water. Uh, the um, non-aqueous layer, the non-polar layer, will have the new haloalkane that's being formed. And uh, I should also note that one of the byproducts of this reaction is going to be water. And so that's why, again, we see those two layers. Um, we can identify which alcohol is which based off of the speed that this reaction occurs. Um, so the tertiary in this case will be the fastest. And um, with the tertiary, it's a really easy to swap that um, alcohol off. Um, it's really, yeah. Um, whereas um, the secondary will react, but it'll be much slower, and the primary will not react at all. So if I do a combination of both, uh, like a dichromate or a permanganate with a Lucas reagent, I can then confidently say which one is which. Um, the reason why that the uh, tertiary is the fastest has to do with the strength of that carbon to oxygen bond in the alcohol component. So um, with that primary alcohol, it is a strong, it is the strongest uh, carbon oxygen bond, um, which is why it's not easy to substitute out. Whereas in the tertiary, it's the weakest carbon oxygen bond. And so it's very easy to kind of swap those two out. Cool. Um, so let me just write that recap here. So this case, the tertiary will go cloudy. Helps if I can spell cloudy. And there's two layers and this will be fast. This will also go cloudy. Uh, there'll be two layers as well, but this will be slow, and this will have uh, no reaction. Cool. All right. Um, I do have a video to show what that looks like. I won't play it now, but you can watch it on the uh, Google site. Um, I figured this is probably enough to kind of show you what's happening. Um, cool. So this then all ties into alcohol oxidation. Um, so it's all about being able to um, oxidize that alcohol component to make a new functional group. Um, so we can do that with dichromate, we can do that with permanganate, both of those are oxidants. Um, tertiary alcohols cannot be oxidized and we'll look at the structure to explain why. Um, secondary alcohols only form ketones. Uh, it doesn't form a carboxylic acid. Um, the reason has to do with how many bonds are available. So let me show you what I mean. So with that primary alcohol, the first, I should, let me backtrack. With the primary alcohol oxidations, you learned this last year of go, as primary alcohols get oxidized to uh, carboxylic acids. What we didn't tell you is that there's an intermediate step um, because that required then learning another functional group. So when primary alcohols get oxidized, there is an intermediate, uh, which is known as an aldehyde. So what happens here is this OH gets removed, the hydrogen gets removed, and you form a double bonded um, oxygen. And then the byproduct is your water. Um, so actually, I should say that this hydrogen, that hydrogen, and that form, and the oxidant, um, and then you have that double bonded oxygen. Um, the aldehyde can get further oxidized, 
So what happens in this case is we have another oxidant and I still have that C double bond O, but now that hydrogen is being replaced by an OH, making a carboxylic acid. Uh, be mindful with the carboxylic acids that um, you need both the double bonded oxygen and the OH for that to occur. Um, and this can only occur on carbon number one, um, because if it's on any other carbon, there won't be enough bonds. Um, so one, two, three, four. If this was somewhere in the middle, then I would have a fifth uh, bond. So that's why we don't see it. Or that's why this is only referring to um, primary alcohols. In the case of secondary alcohols, we have, again, this component and one of the hydrogens that is getting pulled off uh, and that makes the double bonded oxygen this is known as a ketone um, so in this case the suffix changes to an own and that is our new functional group um, you actually don't need to state which carbon it's on unless there's more than four carbons on there um, and this cannot be oxidized any further because remember if i'm going to make a carboxylic acid i need to have another hydrogen there to pull off um, and to put it in an OH. So this one stops at the ketone level. Um, I won't be able to put it in uh, OH there. And so that's why when we say carboxylic acids can only exist in carbon number one uh, for that reason. Tertiary alcohols will not be oxidized at all. And that's because when I look at that tertiary alcohol, I have the OH, but I have no hydrogen there to remove in order to form that double bond. I should also state that these carbons with the double bond have a nickname and that nickname is a carbonyl. Um, so I might, or you guys sh should be referring to these as carbonyls and the location of that carbonyl will decide if it's a ketone or an aldehyde. So with the aldehydes, um, that has the carbonyl on carbon number one. Um, the name is derived from alcohol uh, dehydrogenated because you're removing uh, a hydrogen. Um, and basically that carbonyl has to be on an end carbon. Um, so do keep that in mind. Um, this is the shorthand for the function group. Uh, that's the general formula for it. Um, so when you saw the CPR quiz that we did previously, I can use that general formula to get a gauge on what potential function groups are there. Uh, with the naming of the aldehyde, it's really easy. You remove the E from the end of any um, name and you just change it to an AL ending. Uh, we do not need to number it because it can only be on carbon number one. And uh, since that has to be carbon number one, you number it based off of the aldehyde and then everything else is in reference to that. Uh, same rules apply for the branching and any sort of um, uh, additional function groups. So this function group takes the preference. Um, there are some common names for some of the aldehydes. Uh, but they, on the assessment, will use the, the proper name for them. Ketones are very, very similar to the aldehydes. The main uh, thing that you have to remember is that in the ketone, the carbonyl is not on carbon number one or not on the end carbon. So it can be basically anywhere in the middle of the carbon. Um, you don't need to number them. You don't if they are a ketone with three or four, and that's because the ketone can only exist on one potential carbon. Once we get to five or larger, it can be in multiple locations, so you now need to start specifying where that ketone is. Uh, and the, the name change is in the suffix. You remove the E and you add an um, on ending, so just O-N-E. Um, and like I said, cannot be on carbon number one, because if it's on carbon number one, we are now dealing with a ketone, or with an aldehyde. Cool. So the properties of both of these are relatively similar. Uh, there is some polarity because of the um, oxygen, but it's not a great uh, bit of polarity there. Um, so it won't be soluble. And the other thing to remember about these guys is that they tend to have lower melting and boiling points because with the loss of that um, hydrogen in the alcohol, um, we don't have the hydrogen bonding present anymore. So these will have a lower melting and boiling point compared to the alcohol of the same number. Yeah, which is what I was mentioning before. Uh, main thing to remember about this though is that the larger they get, the, the higher the melting and boiling points are, and that has to just do with the general pattern of uh, longer chain, uh, more intermolecular bonds. Um, that's just some general properties. Um, about them. 
Um, and like I said, with the solubility, the solubility is not as good as um, an alcohol. Um, the aldehydes are a little bit more soluble than the ketones because the carbonyls at the end, uh, which helps it kind of mix in. Um, but the main thing to kind of remember about these guys is that they're not terribly sol soluble. Um, cool. We use them a lot in disinfectants and preservatives. Um, the last thing to kind of think about with the aldehydes is how do we, or aldehydes and ketones is how we test for them um, and how do we distinguish them because they're both very similar. Uh, the main thing would be the aldehyde and the aldehyde will test positive and the ketone will test negative. Uh, the reason why is because the aldehydes can be oxidized a second time to a carboxylic acid where the ketone cannot. Um, there's multiple different tests you can use. There's Benedict's and Fellings. Uh, Benedict's and Fellings are very similar. In both cases, you are dealing with a copper two ion becoming copper one. Um, and in that case, it's turning from a blue color. That's what copper two does. And then copper one is that orangey color. Um, so that's what we see if we're testing for it. Um, and like I said, the ketones won't react because they don't have that ability to do that second oxidation step. Uh, Tolens is another one that you can use as well. It's also known as a silver mirror test. And the reason why it's known as a silver mirror test is that it gets this really pretty um, silver coating on the outside of it, which we saw in this picture here. Um, I have a video as well to show you the process of it. Uh, I won't play it. You can watch it if you want on the Google site. Uh, it is really neat to kind of see, because uh, like I said, it basically makes a silver lining on the glassware. Cool. Kapai, this is um, the lesson done. So by the end, you should be able to uh, know how to test for different alcohols. You should also know how to test for aldehydes and ketones now too. Um, and aldehydes and ketones you should know because we've talked about the oxidation of those alcohols. So you should know some new functional groups. You should know the new oxidation reactions. And you should also know some of the identification process. Oh, I forgot the last one. Cool. So. Now you can move on to your Mahi choice. It's all listed on Google site. You're not expected to do all of it. It's just to give you some options. Uh, the resources are all on Google Classroom.